There are three main uses of skeletons, apart from symbolic or religious ones, in medicine, art, and natural history. And these are loose and overlapping categories, as we'll see. Medical uses might seem the most obvious, but while knowledge of where the bones were in the body was important for surgery, it was much less important for physicians. And an articulated skeleton that showed the relationship among the bones to each other didn't necessarily show how they worked in a functioning body. Here we get into the relative roles and functions of anatomists and surgeons. Not all surgeons were anatomists, and not all anatomists were surgeons. Many anatomists, like Vesalius, were physicians, and there were many surgeons like Paracelsus, or later physicians like Thomas Sydenham, who believed dissection was of little use in understanding the body. Even to many surgeons, a general notion of the location of particular bones, such as this one provided by provided by Hans von Gerstorff in 1517, was sufficient. Anatomical textbooks, which were mostly written by physicians, discuss bones and skeletons in the most anodyne terms. They employ Galen's metaphor of the bones as the foundation of a house. They were earthy in substance. They were evidence of divine planning. While a physician should learn about the bones and the skeleton as part of their education, the specific application of this knowledge remains quite vague. A science of osteology, the study of bones and their diseases and their comparative and developmental study, emerged beginning in the mid-16th century with works by Pierre Ballon and Volker Kreuter. This is a very famous image comparing human and bird bones from Ballon's work on birds from 1555. Developing more fully in the 17th century, this science of osteology led to increased interest in the study of the skeleton and a corresponding need for articulated skeletons. The French surgeon Bartholomew Cabral probably coined the term osteology in the 1590s, but Volker Kreuter, who is a Dutch um, physician, is the key figure here. And this is um, an image of a fetal skeleton from a work of this from 1575. In the 1620s, Adrian van der Spiegel revisited Porter's work from the 1570s on skeletal development, and this was reprinted again in 1659. By the time Bibliotheca Anatomica, that monument to mechanistic anatomy, appeared in 1685, osteology was becoming established as a discipline, and later editions included more and more works on bones and skeletons, until by 1710 they occupied most of the first volume. I really love this title page, this is 1685 title page, which has the human body being dissected, the animals kind of piled up in the base, they're going to get dissected later, and the niches with, um, with mostly with skeletons and also with a the crochet there on the side. But it's just, it's, it's, there's so much going on here. So if skeletons only became important to medicine in the second half of the 17th century, what about natural history? Quarter and Bellon illustrated human and animal skeletons in the mid-16th century, but their example was not taken up until later. Animal skeletons do not figure in the major works of 16th century natural history, and skeletons of any kind are conspicuously absent from the catalogs of cabinets of natural history until the mid-17th century, at least the ones I've looked at. They did show up in anatomy theaters, which functioned both as sites of dissection and as kind of quasi-cabinets. The skeletons that provide, preside in illustrations over anatomy theaters from the Salius to William Hunter serve both anatomical and symbolic roles. And this is obviously not a totally realistic depiction of this anatomy theater, but there are plenty of skeletons around. And there, there are images of this theater without people in it, and the skeletons are still there, both animals. In terms of the order of dissection, the vast majority of anatomical textbooks and atlases started with the skeleton, even though logically it would be the product of dissection rather than its beginning. Therefore, it would be necessary to have a skeleton already present in the dissection room as a reference. In the natural history cabinet, animal skeletons became as important as human. Anatomy and natural history collections mingled and merged in the new academies of the 1660s. And here, for the first time, we begin to see a marketplace for skeletons, human and animal, as objects. 
This might be an artifact of the Americans. We don't have newspaper advertising, for example, until the 1660s, and it only really takes off in the 1690s. But this seems to be when skeletons become commodities. For example, the Andre Colson, an Ebenezer or furniture maker, did taxidermy and made skeletons for the Paris Academy for many years. His counterpart with the Royal Society may have been Nathaniel Highmore, who curated the Society's collections. Private anatomy teachers, owners of cabinets, and artists created a market for anatomical specimens. Let me now briefly turn to artistic uses. Katie Park noted that artists began to study anatomy long before anatomists began seriously to study art. Leon Battista Alberti wrote in Bella Cultura. study the bones before you can really study the rest of the body. So that you kind of start with the bones, you, you clothe it really with the muscles and then with the skin, and that's how you really learn how to draw the human body. By the late 17th century, manuals on human anatomy for artists assumed that students would be able to examine a skeleton. Many manuals of the genre anatomy for artists appeared between 1550 and the 1830s. Here's one example from Heinrich the Bunkingsatz, work on proportion and perspective from 1564. Not all such manuals talk about skeletons, though. Two of the most prominent, from Odoardo Fialetti at the beginning of the 17th century and Gerard de Leclerc toward its end, don't talk about skeletons, even though they were both anatomical illustrators. Fialetti for um, Giulio Caserio and this same image, image was then used in the works of von Jens Spiegel a few years later. His title pages were often reused. And uh, that less for Govard Bindel. Fialetti, like many of his contemporaries, looked toward classical sculpture as a model in his works for students. But by the end of the 17th century, the student of art, as well as the student of anatomy, had access to a skeleton to look at. Francois Poitaba and Roger de Pille wrote the 1668 Abogé d'anatomie au comédéo, Mozart de as a manual for the, Academy, the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, which was founded in the 1660s. They began with a detailed description of the human skeleton with three plates, all of them copied from Vesalius. And they concluded, one must not fail to examine all of this well on a real skeleton, and especially do not continue on to the muscles without knowing the bones perfectly well. Thus, again, students had access to a real skeleton, whether it was at the academy or owned by themselves. 75 years later, Edmé Bouchardon soon began his L'anatomie nécessaire pour du sage de dessin, and also noted that osteology is the basis of anatomy. But his engravings, rather than being based on the sailors, were taken from life or death in the form of the Academy's own skeleton. So we know by the 1730s, the Academy definitely had its own skeleton. <coughs> the teaching of anatomy at the Academy until the time of Jean-Joseph Sue in the 1770s was based on skeletons and cadavers. William Hunter, who began to teach anatomy at the new Royal Academy of Art in London in 1768, used live models as well, and Sue began doing this also a few years later. But Hunter began his lectures with the bones, demonstrating them upon the skeleton. As we see here, there's the skeleton, there's the live body, and there is an crochet next to the live body. Therefore, by the 1660s at least, a skeleton was part of the training of an academic artist. Academies possessed their own skeletons, as did some students and artists. The 18th century British sculptor John Flaxman kept a skeleton in his studio. In his manual, Anatomical Studies of the Bones and Muscles for the Use of Artists, only published posthumously in 1833, was, as his biographer, clearly based on actual examples and not on ideal illustrations. 